Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Exodus 28. We're going to do verses 31 through 43. Here's the text. You are to make the robe of the ephod entirely of blue yarn. All right, so again, this is, uh, this is more detail on this priestly robe um, that was to be worn by Aaron. You're going to see the tunics prescribed to his sons later on in the text. Uh, verse 32, there should be an opening at its top in the center of it. Around the opening, there should be a woven collar with an opening like that of a body of armor so that it does not tear. Again, you can see the, the, practi- the practicality built into this spiritual instrument. It's got to be worn a lot. It's subject to tearing. We've got to make this guy look distinctive, wearing exactly what the Lord told him to wear, because he's going to be stepping into the holiness of God, and he's got, a, he's got sin of his own to atone for, and he's going to be encountering the perfect one. But because of the imperfection of creation, the futility subjected upon creation by God, and the cascading effects of the, the fall of original sin, even the cord used to hold up the Urim and Thummim within the ephod was subject to tearing. So there's practical wisdom in this. Like just make sure that this thing is like body armor and it doesn't tear. All right, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Verse 33, make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn on its lower hem and all around it. Put gold bells between them all the way around so that the gold bells and the pomegranates alternate around the lower hem of the robe. The robe will be worn by Aaron whenever he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he enters the sanctuary before the Lord and when he exits so that he does not die. So this exquisite robe is to be equipped with some jingle bells that make sounds so you can hear Aaron coming. And so you can even stand outside while he's meeting. Is Aaron dead? No, I hear jingling. He's good. <laughs> or he'd made atonement for his own sins before he went inside. This is a priest who's being, he's, he's been called to deal with something a billion times more powerful than a nuclear reactor. The presence of God. And he's way more vulnerable to, to this than he is to radioactivity at a nuclear power plant, for example. He is a sinner encountering the Holy One because it's his calling and it's his job. And so here's his headgear, the turban, right? You thought the turbans were usually associated with, with other religions. You didn't know that this outdates other turbans by, uh, let's see, 2,100 years, 2,200 years. Okay, look at this. Verse 36, you were to make a pure gold medallion and engrave it like the engraving of a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten it to a cord of blue yarn so that it can be placed on the turban. The medallion is to be on the front of the turban. It will be on Aaron's forehead so that Aaron may bear the guilt connected with the holy offerings that the Israelites consecrate as all their holy gifts. It is always to be on his forehead so that they may find acceptance with the Lord. Wow. He's going in there carrying the guilt of the people. He's got this seal on his forehead, holy to the Lord. Always on his forehead at all times. All right. Look at that. This is ancient. This this book, for example, the Quran, these words that we're reading right now are like 2,200 years older than that. So I don't want to hear, I don't want you to think that turbans are exclusively associated with other religions. Here's something that is millennia older than other faith systems, you know, even beyond Islam, other faith systems as well that include turbans. This is the second book of the Bible. It doesn't get any older than this. Turbans are a Judeo-Christian thing. Verse 39, you are to weave the tunic from fine linen, make a turban of fine linen, and make an embroidered sash. Make tunics, sashes, and headbands for Aaron's sons to give them glory and beauty. Now, yesterday, uh, or sorry, two devotions ago, we saw the unfortunate incident with the strange fire in which two of Aaron's sons made their own fire and brought it before the Lord. They're consumed with fire and then they're, they're charred corpses still wearing their tunics are put outside the camp. These are the tunics that they were wearing. So you can see that these garments don't make the priest holy. 
Okay, they don't protect him necessarily from the whole from from the holiness of God, and they don't exempt him when he rebels against God. All right, the man wearing this outfit still has to seek holiness himself. It still has to do as God said. You can't just flagrantly disobey God, wear one of these nifty tunics, and you're good. Just ask, uh, just ask uh, Aaron's two sons, uh, two of Aaron's four sons. Put these on your brother Aaron and his sons, then anoint, ordain, and consecrate them so that they may serve me as priests. Make them linen undergarments to cover their naked bodies. They must extend from the waist to the thighs. All right? Get it? All right? Modern day jockey shorts. They have a precedent in the book of Exodus. These must be worn by Aaron and his sons whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to minister in the sanctuary area so that they do not incur guilt and die. There it is again. This is to be a permanent statute for Aaron and his future descendants. Now, they did, two of Aaron's sons did incur guilt and they did die because they brought strange fire forward, not the fire set by God. Look at how these things are, you know, they're to protect the priests from the mortal danger they're in while they're doing their jobs. This came up in our, in our curriculum text. It asked the question, like, why are these guys in mortal danger? They're priests after all. Okay, so uh, at this point, I believe you've already had that session, so I'll just go ahead and spoil it for you. Because the priests have sin of their own. Okay, priests sin too. The only people who are called to be pastors, for example, today are people who stumble. They're, if, if you're looking for a sinless pastor... Not going to find one. All of us, every one of us sins. Every pastor alive still struggles with something. So that's why this was such deadly business because you had men who were subject to the depraved nature walking into the presence of God, dealing with holy matters, all right, to try to carry the guilt of the people before God to make a temporary atonement. And they had their own jank. They had their own sin. Here is where I want to bring this and wrap this up today. Here's the New Testament commentary on this, showing how it's fulfilled in Christ. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. When Aaron would go there and hear from God on behalf of the people, he was like an inter intermediary for us. He was an intercessor. And Christ intercedes for us. He is the superior intercessor. For this is the kind of high priest we need. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son, capital S, who has been perfected forever. So take everything that we've learned about this priestly garment and the tunic and the uh, tunic for his sons and the ephod and the Urim and the Thummim. All of it is now made obsolete. Cool as it would be to find these artifacts, guess what? They're useless because Christ has fulfilled what these merely typified and foreshadowed. He didn't have to make atonement for his own sin. Jesus had no sin. He has been perfected forever. He is the great high priest, not a descendant of Levi. He comes from the tribe of Judah. He is, according to the book of Hebrews, then a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he is superior to every priest of all the Old Testament. And he's the chief shepherd over all of us under shepherds, high in the New Testament. He is the perfect one who didn't just come and offer a bull, didn't just offer a sheep, didn't offer a lamb, didn't sprinkle the blood of anything. He spilled his own blood. He broke his own body. He sacrificed himself. And he didn't have to wear jingle bells to make sure he didn't die before he did it because he was sinless. So all of these priestly garments, they all created an office of an Old Testament priest, which merely foreshadowed the ultimate great high priest, Jesus. Jesus had no need for these garments because he is holy. And he didn't have to bring anything with him to the cross. He sacrificed himself. Amen?